Uh, I'm very honored to be on this panel this, uh, this afternoon and uh, also to be back at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. I want to give a little shout out to Charles Bronfman, who's in the audience, uh, the man who brought the Expos to, to Montreal. But not only did he bring the Expos to Montreal, he also brought the Institute for the Study of Canada to McGill. So thank you very much, Mr. Bronfman, for all of your, uh, for all, for all of your good work towards McGill and uh, to the Faculty of Arts. It's rare that, um, well, maybe not in this town, uh, that you see more than one premier on a panel. But uh, I think what's rare in this instance is that we are in the presence of two premiers who did great work for their individual provinces, but also two premiers who come from two different parts of Canada. And I think that's really the strength of what we have here in a conference on federalism, is to understand what federalism means in different parts of Canada from the people who have actually lived uh, that experience. This conference is on issues that have shaped federalism. Uh, it's on the division of powers, it's been on talking to how that relationship between federal and provincial governments happen. But since we've heard from scholars of federalism, we've heard from uh, people who work as different stakeholders, uh, both in federal governments and around provincial governments. But this afternoon, we have the rare opportunity to actually talk with politicians with a capital P, that is to say the leaders of individual provinces, of large provinces, who have had a great impact in, the, uh, in federalism, Canadian federalism, in the past, uh, in the past decade and certainly um, have had, left their mark um, on Canadian politics. Ça me fait un grand plaisir de vous présenter uh, nos deux conférenciers uh, cet après-midi. D'abord, uh, l'honorable Jean Charest, qui a été premier ministre du Québec de 2003 à 2012 et député de Sherbrooke et chef du Parti libéral euh, du Québec de 1998 à 2012. Premier euh, Jean Charest uh, was the initiator of the negotiation of the economic and trade agreement between Canada and the European Union. He has concluded the most modern labor mobility agreement with France and his government delivered the Plan Nord, a sustainable development plan for Northern Quebec. Today, as a partner in the law firm McCarthy Tetro, he provides expertise to the firm's clients with his in-depth knowledge and experience in public policy and international matters. Monsieur Charest has also been on the other side of the, of the federalism divide as a former deputy prime minister of Canada, a former federal minister of the environment and leader of the uh, now defunct uh, progressive Conservative Party, when it was a party of two, when it was a party of two. We remember those years. We remember those years. With parody. With parody. There you go. <laughs> Let's not forget. The Honorable Christy Clark, thank you, Madam Clark, for being with us uh, from British Columbia, was Premier of British Columbia from 2011 to 2017 having before served as a member of the Legislative Assembly and holding the positions of Minister of Education and before that Child and Family Development in BC Liberal governments. Madame Clark is someone to be reckoned with as a Premier. She was the longest serving female Premier in Canadian history, the only female Premier to be re-elected in Canada, and the first Canadian Cabinet Minister to give birth while holding office. You go, girl. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> In over six and a half years as Premier, she proved to be the best economic manager in the country. She balanced five consecutive budgets, we know how difficult that is, diversified BC's economy, and ensured that BC led in job creation across Canada. When she left office in 2017, British Columbia could boast having the strongest economy in Canada for more than one year running. So thank you very much to both of you for being here with us this afternoon. I guess, I guess I'd like to start with an icebreaker question, if you don't mind, and just ask, because I see that there are students in the audience, there are professors in the audience, there are former colleagues in the audience. We've had, a, you know, it's been a bit of a fraught period in Canadian politics in these past few months, and I was wondering whether both of you could maybe speak to what it takes to aspire to political office in 
a federal kind of a country. So in the sense, what does it take to aspire to be in office at the provincial level, knowing that your Balawick is not only what you do in your own province, but indeed is representing that province across Canada uh, through the federal system? Um, well, first, running for office is its own unique thing. I do encourage everybody to do it. Can I just, you know, from a gender parity perspective, when you ask a woman to run for office, she always, always says, I don't think I know all your policies. What about my mom? She's got Alzheimer's. I have to look after her. My kids are going to school. The dog is peeing in the basement. They've got a million different excuses to not do it. And you go and you ask a guy if he wants to run, and he inevitably says, I can't believe it took you so long to ask me. <laughs> And that is an, and Jean will probably tell you the same thing, having worked to recruit so many women to run. So it's a, it's a hard decision to make. It's a worthy decision though, because it is so fulfilling to know that you have an opportunity to make a real difference in people's lives. And I am not, you know, I have to say that when I became premier in 2011, although I'd been deputy premier and uh, minister in a government for five years before that, I, uh, I, I think I underestimated how much time I would spend on federal-provincial relations. Um, but the other thing I would say, though, um, unlike in Quebec and in Alberta, where people are consumed with the issues around federalism and the relationship between their provinces and the federal government, as my dad used to say back in the day, no longer true since Mr. Charest took over, uh, Quebec wants out, Alberta wants in, and BC just doesn't care. <laughs> and so, while it's a vitally important part of government infrastructure, it is not something that consumes a lot of time in public opinion. So it's very much uh, something behind the curtain, um, therefore something whose impact I underestimated. So I can't really tell you that when I ran, I thought a whole lot about that before I got here. Mr. Charest, you're one of the longest serving parliamentarians. Uh, I'm not going to even try to guess what age you were when you started, but it wasn't much older than some of the students in this room. 26. When there I you go. Elected. There you go. And you became a minister at 26, too. At 28. 28. 28. 28. It seemed, I, I thought it was long, but the people I served thought it was even longer. <laughs> So what's the difference of that divide? Well, let me answer your first question mm -hmm. a bit in a roundabout way about uh, those who serve in office by s saying that in my observation, I, have, I don't think I have met someone who has been an MNA or a legislative uh, elected in a province or federally uh, for whom it wasn't the most exciting moment, period of their lives. You know, it, and notwithstanding everything you hear about politics and it's tough and the family, but it's it, it's the most exciting moment in their lives. And when they leave politics, they miss it. It's a t difficult transition. And why? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that because you're on the first, well, no matter what position you're in, you're on the first row of everything that's happening in, in society. You see it in real time. It unfolds in front of your eyes. And if you're in government or even in opposition, you see all of this. So it's, it's an experience unlike any other experience. And those who run uh, have a pretension and uh, that they have the ability to change things. If they're running for reasons and the right reasons, because they know or they think, they believe in, in, in that pretense that they can actually change something. And, uh, and if they understand uh, that, uh, that motivation and they understand politics, they will change things, and probably in a more difficult way than what they thought, but it will. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll just close by uh, telling you an anecdote. After I left office, it was after 28 years, I remember uh, giving a speech somewhere and thinking, you know, if I had been offered a choice at, when I was 26, someone would have said, Jean, you can be a billionaire today. Or, here are the next 28 years of your life in, in public office. There is no doubt in my mind that I would have chosen to be in public office. When you think of my, you live once. Yeah. I had 28 years of very intense life mm -hmm. where things, I lived and, and, and I was in the now, I had the sense of. And so isn't that what our lives are about in the end? So, but I do want to I do want to acknowledge Charles Brofman before because and thank uh, Charles for 
having endowed Miguel with this extraordinary gift and, uh, and, and allowing us to be here today. It's a real honor to be with you, who is the author of a best-selling book, by the way, <laughs> very recently. And I wanted to also point out, if you don't mind, there, I have ex-colleagues are in the room. Jean-Marc Fourny was my Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. He was in the government of Mr. Couillard, and he's here. And he wrote a piece this week about la francophonie canadienne in La Presse Plus. If you haven't read it, I invite you to read it. And Jeff Kelly, who was my Minister of Indian and, uh, and Northern Affairs and continued under Mr. Couillard. And you have to be the longest serving uh, minister in that job. And Mr. Marie Nelly, who was also a member of the legislature. And I wanted to also acknowledge Graham Fraser, who's a very good friend and our commissioner of official languages, Alex Patterson, who I've had the pleasure of working with. And finally, Chris Reagan. I don't know whether Chris has moved, gone, stayed there with us. Right He's there. here. Who chairs the Echo Fiscal Commission, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you interested in environmental issues and carbon taxes and all the demography that we're hearing about this lately. He is the, the number one authority, probably uh, not just in Canada, but in the world on the issue of carbon taxes. Mm -hmm. So if we have a, a discussion today, Chris, I hope you'll stay around because you're the, the right person to answer a lot of the questions. So thank you very much. I have to go home now. <laughs> Don't you go anywhere. But I just wanted to mention, uh, Chris Reagan is the, is the director of our new um, School of Public Policy, the Max Bell School of Public Policy, which is another kind of interesting, there's a federalism twist because it's a foundation that's actually in Calgary, uh, and yet it has um, generously supported uh, the founding of our new School of Public Policy here uh, in Montreal at McGill University, and Chris uh, is the new director, and Ms. Clark is uh, also involved as a member of the advisory board, co-chair co yeah. co -chair of the advisory board, so all things come together, yeah. you see, and to make for uh, an interesting life uh, here at McGill. I've always wanted to be a part of the McGill community, but when I applied, McGill wouldn't accept me. So uh -oh. I'm very glad to be back. <laughs> and I was just bright enough not to apply. <laughs> And Daniel Bellin, I wanted to thank you also. You have the best job in, uh, in Montreal, one of the best jobs. You know you get paid for this. Yeah, that's the good part. That's the good part. You should be embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> and our panelists aren't getting paid, but I still have questions to ask them. Uh, mainly, uh, one of the things that has interested uh, Daniel and when he was bringing together this theme of federalism and the changing, shifting uh, federal landscape is that in in the study of politics, we often talk about how federalism goes through different kinds of shifts, right? Mm -hmm. So cooperative federalism, the post-war, we have collaborative federalism, we've had conflict conflictual federalism, we've had constitutional federalism, which you yes. uh, lived through as well. Where are we at right now in Canada? Can we qualify the situation that we find ourselves in in terms of the, of the pattern of, of where we're at in intergovernmental relations. Go? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, I went through the period of what you identify as constitutional federalism mm -hmm. when the, the question was asked uh, on the angle of how can we modify, change the constitution, repatriate the constitution, get a amending formula. And that was the angle under which the discussion and the debate happened. And all of that came to an end after the uh, aborted uh, attempt to do the Meech Lake Accords at the end of the 90s and wore out the country, literally. I and mean, it was a very interesting period politically, Antonia, because when we arrived there, we're, we're, the country's really worn out by it. And the Mulroney government, who I was very proud to be a, a member of, is a, was a very activist government, a transformational government. Mm -hmm. But by the time we had finished in 1993, the country was ready for a break and elected Mr. Chrétien in that environment. And Mr. Chrétien very wisely understood the nature of his mandate and said, you know what, my job is to come in the morning, open the lights, close them, manage this thing well. And I think he did very well in his mandates. So that sort of brought that to an end. And then I'm in that transition period where it leads up to the 95 referendum with the very close call of 0.5 percent difference in the vote. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want a little capsule of what could have happened, think Brexit and multiply that by, because Brexit's about a country breaking out of a broader agreement. Our referendum was about breaking up a country. So think Brexit, multiply many times, and that gives you a sense of, of what could have uh, happened. 
And then we moved to the period of 98, and then the period of, that I entered into with Jean-Marc and, and Jeff at the time was one where we, our view was that we should bring about change within our federal system in a non-constitutional manner, substantive, real change, which we actually did with a whole number of agreements, asymmetric federalism, the agreement on health care, the uh, recognition of Quebec as a nation, not a distinct society, but as a nation, the agreement we did on UNESCO, and a whole series of changes we made with a view that if one day the country is again in a mode of making constitutional changes, we will have established the groundwork. We will have done, set the table, so to speak. That was our view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and our view also was that not all changes happens within the constitutional uh, file or theme. Federalism is designed in such a way where there is a lot of flexibility outside of the constitutional realm to do a whole series of changes. So, so that's the view we brought to it. We had the period of Mr. Harper, which there's a lot to say about, good and bad. And uh, I had a very interesting uh, meeting with Mr. Ibbotson, who, Ibbotson, who wrote a book about... Uh, Iverson? Iverson, about saying how Mr. Harper was great on federalism. There was no federal provincial conflicts. <laughs> and I, well, that's it. <laughs> I looked... I looked at him, I said, you said the meetings, you know, went well. I said, sure they did. He never called me. <laughs> it's, it's like the guy who says, I get around great with my partner. You know, I just never show up at home. <laughs> Absent and, uh, and then it was a period of cooperative federalism with ups and downs. And, uh, and I'll say, I'm knowing I'm long, but I do want to say something about our federalism just to set the mind, set the stage. The federal system of government we have in Canada is among the most decentralized in the world. The federal government's like a holding company. They transfer money for old age pensions, equalization, and, but the federal government runs very little things in the country. They don't run a lot of things. The country is run by the provinces, healthcare, education, the roads. The day-to-day -day life of this country is in the hands of the provinces, and they're the ones who run the show. And that's why, by the way, we are so, the provinces are so irritated when the federal government walks up to them and says, you know, Jean, your health care thing, you should do this or you should do that. And our, we think in our mind every time, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. You haven't run anything, actually. And uh, it, it irritates us in that way. So I just, and I'll finish on one thought as we look to the next campaign. Think Pharmacare. Uh -huh. Now they want to do a Pharmacare program. Yeah. Watch the reaction of the province. Watch the reaction of the province. <laughs> the pro I know exactly what they're, the provinces are going to be thinking. They say, here we go again. Here we go again. They're going to say, I'm going to fund it 50%. Yeah, today. And in five years from now, they'll say, well, you know, we have a budget crisis. And the provinces will be left holding the bag, having to run the program. I'm just give you, an, you know, an encapsulation of how things look sometimes from the perspective of those who are on the other side. So I've been long, Ken. No. Madam, Madam Clark, on that theme, you came to, you, you came to the premiership uh, in about the same time Monsieur Charest left. So uh, there, was it, there was a two year overlap. Two year overlap, yeah. yep. Happiest years of our lives. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit about how so you said British Columbia sees federalism a little differently than th from this part of the world, um, but also you came in, you came in, into the leadership role at a different time in federalism as well. Yeah, so Stephen Harper was prime minister, mm -hmm. and, um, and then of course Justin Trudeau became prime minister before I retired. So I saw two very different uh, approaches. Now, my experience of it is that they both hated me and my province equally. <laughs> and that is the experience that almost every premier has of every single prime minister that walks through the door. I'm pretty sure, I mean, although I think that Paul Martin and maybe Jean Chrétien might have been uh, exceptions to that, but um, I wasn't there for that. And I remember thinking, boy, you know, Stephen Harper, he's just so hard on us, you know? He never, never wants to enter into a dialogue and boy, I wonder if the new guy will be better. And nope, new guy wasn't better. And so I think there is 
always competition between prime ministers and premiers. In as much as prime ministers have this idea when they first get elected that they run the country. And as Jean pointed out, they don't run anything. And premiers have this idea, of course, that we are partners in Confederation. The prime minister is only a first among, among equals. So the stage is set for, at almost a personal level, some conflict that's already automatically going to happen. I, I, um, I do think, though, the thing that has changed dramatically is um, while Stephen Harper would intervene when it was politically useful, sometimes he mostly didn't. Didn't meet, didn't intervene that much, um, and most of the conflict was kept to a minimum. This government is the most interventionist federal government British Columbia and Westerners have seen in a long time, like since his dad. And that's creating a lot of conflict for people. And, the, and uh, so, we, and here are the trends that I think um, are affecting federalism today. The first one is we live in a hyper-competitive, globalized environment in the world. And so, you know, back in the 70s, Canada had a highly regulated economy that was dominated by some very large central Canadian-based businesses. And it was easier to run the country from Ottawa back in those days. Well, Canada had one customer. We had a few large businesses. We had high tariffs in the country. And um, we kept competition out. So we didn't need to be competitive. Now we need to be competitive. We've got free trade agreements, thank goodness. We've got lower tariffs. We've got a huge Western uh, economy in Western Canada that is much more free market oriented and less, regula uh, less regulated. You cannot run the economies of this country from Ottawa anymore. And that's, I think, become a real conflict because provincial economies in Canada are each entirely unique and each one of them is dependent on provincial services to succeed. The only thing that um, provincial governments outside Quebec don't uh, need to have in their toolbox that we don't is immigration. But education, infrastructure to a large extent, although it's, uh, it's also funded by the federal government, environmental regulation, um, indigenous relations, all of that can largely be done at the provincial level. If immigration was part of the package, it would be easier for provinces to to build economies. So that's the first thing. Can't run Canada from Ottawa anymore, and Ottawa thinks you can. The second thing is this, though. In light of that, um, as we, I hope, become more decentralized in terms of decision making in Canada, there is still, and in fact, there's an even stronger need for Ottawa to be the guardian of the national interest. And this is being played out more clearly than it ever has before with the responsibility for Ottawa to step in and make sure that we get pipelines built to the coast. It's going to, it's what going to save Medicare. It's going to, what's going to make sure that our children aren't burdened with the more billions in, of dollars in debt. And it's going to make sure that this country continues to enjoy a high standard of living. That is in the national interest. But Ottawa hasn't, um, I mean, uh, we could have an argument about that, I'm sure. I don't think Ottawa has, has done yet what it needs to do to protect that national interest. But there are lots of other examples of that across the country. And those two things are push and pull. And I think that those are the primary conflicts that we're facing right now in federalism, Antonia. But Madam Clark, how do premiers go about trying the to address that, those kinds of impasses? What is, what is the role? for the individual premiers that are involved in that conflict, so mentioned the, the pipeline, BC and Alberta, but also premiers as a, I think as a it's, group. I don't think premiers can do it. I mean, this is really, this is really truly a national interest mm -hmm. argument, and it can't be done by BC and Alberta at the moment. I mean, you know, uh, three years ago it could have been done, it was different governments, but sometimes this just happens, and so, um, you know, it's time for the feds to step in and make sure it gets done. There isn't, I don't think, another answer. And I understand it's a very sensitive issue in Quebec, um, but uh, you know, I would honestly say, as somebody who cares about Medicare, um, you know, I think the federal government should be defending our national interest in Quebec as well when it comes to pipelines. Monsieur Charest, le Conseil de la Fédération, est-ce que ouais. ça, c'est encore mm. quelque chose qui vraisemblablement pourrait aussi uh, jouer un rôle 
Ce rôle-ci ou d'autres rôles, est-ce qu'il y a une place encore pour le Conseil que vous avez un peu créé? Bien, le, le Conseil de la Fédération euh, a été créé en 2003. C'est une idée qui est née euh, d'un travail qui avait été fait par euh, mon équipe en opposition et également sous le leadership de Benoît Pelletier. Alors, Benoît Pelletier est professeur à l'Université d'Ottawa, se fait élire prof de droit constitutionnel, se fait élire avec nous en 1998, <coughs> était brillant, un homme brillant. Et nous avions, euh, Benoît et moi, entrepris une tournée du Canada et, euh, pour rencontrer euh, les premiers ministres, pour les consulter, pour les écouter et pour préparer la campagne électorale de 2003 et les changements que nous voulions dans le domaine des affaires intergouvernementales. Maintenant, it's interesting. When we, when we toured Canada, Benoit and I, not only did we meet with the premiers, we met with every opposition leader, no matter how many members they had, because one of the lessons I had learned from Meech was that on issues of unity, intergovernmental relations, everyone needs to be at the table. It would, it's a good idea to bring them there way in advance. In fact, in the case of Meech, had we done that earlier, and I'm not blaming those who were there because I think it's something we learned afterwards, you are going to create much better conditions to succeed at whatever you're doing. So what emerged from that was a paper that, uh, that we put together on intergovernmental relations. And the idea of the Council of the Federation was not only reinforcing the relationship that we have with the federal government, but more intergovernmental relation among ourselves. And it worked fabulously well at the health conference held by uh, Premier, Prime Minister Martin in 2004. That was the first real test. And, uh, and after that, I, 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 I'm of mixed feelings on it because I'm disappointed that the Council of the Federation didn't do more. I would have wanted us to do like the American governors and to have a building in Ottawa, to have a small team of bureaucrats there doing communications. One of the things the country suffers from, by the way, in terms of uh, interprovincial relations is that the country is very Ottawa-centric. And the Ottawa press report the Ottawa view which is very, very biased and limited. And if you're a premier, you're often frustrated by reading the national media or listening to it because they're missing a whole part of the story. For example, one of the things in Ottawa is don't hold federal provincial meetings because the provinces only show up to ask money. <laughs> and that's it. So don't do it. And it's now, if you talk to the Ottawa bureaucracy, that's, that's exactly what they all think, without exception, don't do the meeting. It's, frankly, it's insulting to the provinces. Of course we discuss money, and of course we discuss, but it's much, much, much more than that. And in the case of the Council of the Federation, I had proposed to colleagues, this was before Christy was elected, that we buy a building, that we put together a bureaucracy, that we sort of and be inspired by what the Americans do with the American Governors Association and reinforce our voice. But that never came to be because the provinces had a view, a number of them, that uh, that wasn't for us to do. And in the case of Ontario, and now I'm going to be a little, maybe a peu méchant vis-à-vis l'Ontario, Ottawa's in Ontario. They didn't, what interest did they have of having the others? They are, they're already there in front of, uh, so we sort of have the feeling, they didn't say it out loud, but what was in it for them to uh, bring uh, people together? One, vo one word, though, about federalism, Christy. When it comes to defining the national interest, the view in Quebec was very much that we are part of that discussion. And it can't be left to the federal government alone. That was one of the first real disagreements I had with Dalton McGuinty around the health conference. Dalton had just been elected, and his view was, well, it's the feds that need to define a national interest. I disagree. They are not, they are not the only ones to define the national interest. We are, and especially in a country of federal uh, construct, where jurisdictions are shared. The other thing to remember from the Quebec perspective that's very different from other provinces, when we look at federalism, we see federalism as it is. Governments that are equal in their areas of jurisdiction. The government of Quebec does not and has never perceived itself as being a lower level of government relative to the federal government. Ottawa sees the provinces as a lower level of government. 
but they are not, and it's a mistake on their part. And, uh, and that's in Quebec something that is very well understood and a source of frustration to the point where, in many instances, I would have liked the federal government to be as federalist as I was because I found a lot of their decisions to not be done in a federalist uh, way and certainly not with a view of practicing federalism. Mm. The provinces practice federalism in a more loyal, more authentic, real way than the federal government did in a lot of instances. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, struck by that answer and I, and I keep coming, I, I'm, I'm seeing in my mind the photo of the recreation of the fathers and mothers of Confederation in which um, uh, Mr. Charest, you were not in it, but Madame Clark, you were in it on the steps of um, PEI. PEI, the legislative uh, building there too. So how does that feel for you? Are you, do you, are you in agreement with, uh, with Mr. Charest that there is a sense that in their spheres of, in their areas of jurisdiction, provinces are in effect the major players in that sense? Yeah, I, I think so, and I think the better decision makers, because economies are, are local, and each economy in this country is entirely different and unique. So when you're closer to the ground, so take something like um, workforce preparation. Impossible to do that well all the way if you want to if you want to do it for Alberta or Saskatchewan or Quebec mm -hmm. in Ottawa. Only really provincial governments can do that kind of planning and think about, okay, so you know, McGill, we need you to produce, we, we're short in engineers. We need you to produce, uh, we'll give you this, you know, we will provide you funding for this many more seats in engineering. Those, and those decisions, when you're thinking, you know, you gotta work backwards, sometimes to high school, that's all provincially managed for a reason because we're closer to making sure the economy is prepared for what's coming next in, the ch in, in those things. So look at how the federal government has done with its infrastructure money. Like nothing's, get, nothing's gotten out the door. And again, I would argue on infrastructure, it works pretty well because they take the recommendations of provinces, but when they don't take recommendations of provinces, it doesn't work very well and you get a whole bunch of outcomes that no one wanted or expected. So. Um, I hope that answers your question, Antonia. It does, but tell me a little bit more about why there's this sense between Ottawa and the provinces of this kind of, I don't know, kind of contested boundaries in some way and contested voice maybe even uh, on the political stage. Is it, because, is, it, is it a tug of political war? Is it mistrust? Is it just kind of learned behavior? I, well, I think it's, I, you know, I actually think that arguing, and I, I know this isn't, necess, this isn't necessarily true for Quebec, but I actually think that in the rest of Canada, arguing with the federal government, that push and pull has actually been a good thing for Canada. I think what it does is it pulls us to the center, and I think Canada is better when we're less polarized. Um, and so I, I think we just disagree. That's part of it. And we have ways of sorting that out as the whole carbon tax, uh, pan-Canadian carbon tax um, situation is demonstrating in this country right now. So I think on healthcare, we have ways of figuring that out. And I think um, it's, as I said, it's natural for prime ministers, or it appears to become a habit for prime ministers to think that they are not first among equals, that they are just first which creates an inherent conflict, but I don't think that's the big problem. I just think that we disagree about how to do things. And the federal government is always looking for an opportunity to do an announcement. So that means <laughs> that they want to deliver money for MPs in their ridings who get to do an announcement, and that might have nothing to do with the appropriate, uh, the appropriate spending on, on the nation's behalf. But you know what? Provinces do the same thing. I did. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so on, on health care, Mr. Charest, uh, Roy Romano, the former Premier of Saskatchewan, when he was um, writing his Romano report, talked about a lot of long-distance hollering uh, between the premiers. So is that, is that yep. something you either uh, uh, did, aspire to, or uh, witnessed? Well, in, in Quebec, disagreeing with the federal government is a very good Politically, I mean, it's popular yeah. if you fight with the federal government. It is, it is. Now, I didn't, I never went out looking for fights with the federal government. I never backed down from it. 
And I was also mindful of the federal brand. Mm -hmm. If I had a disagreement with the federal government, I wouldn't try to demolish the federal <clears throat> brand, so to speak. And uh, I, I do think it's very important to have a premier who is a federalist. It, believe me, it makes a fundamental difference in the way you approach the country and policy making and agreements. If you are not a federalist, then you have no vested interest in making the system work effectively. You're only, you're on one side of the ledger only, and that's enhancing your political position back home and not that of the country. You see the rest of the country as either being indifferent, not relevant to your interest, or even hostile, which is something to keep in mind. So I think you, you need to have premiers who are federalists. Uh, on, on the comment of conflict, I just I want to reassure you today, we could go through this discussion today and you could all walk out of the room thinking that we fight all the time and we disagree in the system. Actually, disagreement is the mainstay of politics mm -hmm. every day. Right. Our system of government, by the way, folks, federal, works very well. We have governments that operate very well. And yes, part of it is disagreements. And sometimes, one of the disappointments, I've dealt with prime ministers who in one case, if you disagreed, he would pout. In the other case, he would want to reap revenge. <laughs> Which is very disappointing because if you're mature, in the, the, uh, there are real disagreements on how things, and yeah. you should be able to discuss them. Right. I'm gonna do a, a, a commercial for Jean Chrétien who in my experience was the best to deal with. I'm leaving Mr. Mulroney aside because I was, I came in with him and I think he's, he's I'm a great friend of his and I'm, so, I'm not, a, I'm biased. But in the case of Jean Chrétien, I had roll out fights with him. And the next morning you'd call, you'd say, we have this to deal with. He'd say, sure, let's get on with it. And we'd move on. And uh, so it's all part of, part right. of of political life, and we shouldn't be intimidated by that, we shouldn't be. Uh... Now, you talked of health care, and I want to point to one simple power the federal government has that skews the playing field in their favor and everything, and it's called the spending power. The federal government, if they have the cash, they can do a lot of things on their own, and they can override provincial jurisdictions. And that is a source of irritation. So they can come in and undo systems, and, and, and that's something, frankly, that needs to be better supervised. But the federal government has a huge power, and that's the cash they have. Mind you, on budgets right now, the provincial governments are very constrained. Healthcare and the feds, they have maneuvering room on budgets that we, would, we could only dream of. And so that's, that in our federal system is something. One last word on how the system works, where I think we should be looking and going. I think the, the federal government underestimates its power of convening, of creating consensus, of creating cohesion among the provinces and using its spending power in that way, that we are in a period now where it's sort of understood without much reflection in Ottawa that you shouldn't get the provinces together because they're all going to ask for money and they're little greedy people who want, you know, and they want to get reelected. You know, oh my God, they want to get reelected. What a surprise. So, as though they don't want to get reelected. <laughs> there is a lot of space that is not, you know, opportunities untapped where the federal government could just use its convening power, its ability to bring people together, to look at issues together, and then work together. And they don't, they don't use that. I want to say a word about health care because it's a very good example. The feds, when they create, health care is created, they're funding, and it was, by the way, it was inspired by Saskatchewan. It wasn't inspired by the feds. Saskatchewan inspired it, Tommy Douglas, and the feds took it on, which is a, a quality in politics. One thing I've all learned, my colleagues and I, if you see a good idea out there, Steal it. That's right. <laughs> and take credit for it. It's which a liberal the, motto. It's, uh, <laughs> which the, it's a quality, ladies it's and gentlemen. It's not a fault. Let, 
Take yeah, credit. In fact, Lester Pearson wrote in his memoirs that uh, the liberals stole the, N the NDP or the CCF's idea while they were bathing in holy water. So well, they, that's, that's right. To stole their clothes. So they do it, but they're funding it at 50%. And by the time we have the Federal, yep. federal Provincial Conference, Roy Romano has done his tour of the country, and I think we're at 21% of funding by the federal government, but we're running the programs, and the feds want to call the shots. And there's a simple rule in life. You want to, if you want to pay, if you want to play, you have to pay. If you want to call the shots, then pay. And the province were saying to the feds, you know, you're not going to tell me what to do if you're paying 21%. Mr. Romano says to them, at least move it up to 25%, which they're not at now. So why back to pharmacare? How do you, what do you think the provinces are thinking right now? And they're absolutely right. So the federal government would come out with a big pharmacare program today, and they're going to fund it at 50%. I guarantee you, if that were the case, I guarantee you, 15 years at the latest, they'll be down at funding at 30% and saying, well, we're sorry, we have yeah. to bow. And then you know what? Do the provinces close down their pharmacare programs? Could we close down our emergency rooms and say, I'm sorry, the feds are only funding 20%. We can't fix your arm today. Come back tomorrow. That's where there's a, that's, that's right. those are real issues that create where, where we can do better at, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, frankly. Mm -hmm. And by the way, on health care, you'll remember, this is Goldblum. You co-chaired a committee that gave us advice on long-term care and very good advice that we followed part of it. But you were mostly a troublemaker when you did that for us. <laughs> We need those two. <laughs> We're very disappointed in you. Her co-chair ran as a PKIS candidate and became the Minister of Health. Oh, no. That's what happens when you do royal commissions. They run against you after that in the next campaign. There's, a, there's conflict between the federal government and the provinces, but there's also conflict between provinces. So. Um, uh, Ms. Clark, I know this is kind of an elephant in your room uh, these days in your part of the, the world. Tell us a little bit about the conflict between British Columbia and Alberta. Well, it's yeah, <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> well, um, you know, the, it's a, it's, it is really a political conflict mm -hmm. at this point. I mean, there, I, it, I say that having also said, though, that this pipeline is absolutely, all of them are in the national interest, and there's a very strong economic reason to do it, one of them actually being health care. We spend $248 billion a year in Canada on health care. Last year it grew, or last, uh, last year you can get in Stats Canada, it grew by a total of 4%, which is about uh, $2 billion a year, or sorry, $18 billion a year, which is exactly the amount of money that oil and gas contribute to the tax uh, coffers of uh, Canadian governments across the country. So just imagine that, just to put that in context, if oil and gas does not grow as a percentage of the economy, there will be no money to grow health care at all beyond its current level at a time <coughs> when our population is aging. I mean, you could choose any other government service, but health care, I know, is one that, you know, it's the biggest, the most important one for most people. Um, what we've got happening in British Columbia is, you know, a, a, a minority government that's that's supported by the Greens and has a lot of Green members within its own caucus. They have a political imperative to try and be seen to be stopping the pipeline and they've decided to do that. There is a minority of public opinion in British Columbia that supports, uh, that supports the government's position, but it is not a big minority. Um, and uh, the majority of British Columbians are saying, get on with it. The, Issues, though, for the you know the very real issues for people in my province are: how are we going to make sure we look after our precious coastline, which is our we consider our sacred duty for our province and for the rest of the country? What are we going to do about spills? How will we make sure that we get economic benefit? And how do we make sure that Indigenous people are fully part of the process in terms of not just making the decisions, being big beneficiaries, big winners financially from it as well? So. You know, you got this political problem with a government that's, it's really, I mean, in, I, I wish I could cast it in more principled terms, but I really do think that, um, you know, the makeup with the Greens in the government uh, has changed the way, I mean, it was, a, it was a previously approved project. And then in Alberta, you've got a government, an NDP government that can only get elected if they get this thing done. And remember, for Premier Notley, 
She made a, an agreement with Prime Minister Trudeau that she would introduce a carbon tax and she sold it to Albertans saying, in exchange for the carbon tax, we get the pipeline. She did her part of the deal and the feds haven't delivered their end yet. So she has, a, in the midst of a provincial election campaign, a huge um, imperative, an urgent imperative to be seen to be fighting for pipelines. So, you know, it's, um, I, as I said, I don't think there's a way for the premiers to solve it. It can only be solved with the federal government stepping in and rather than kind of winking at protesters and saying, you know, um, carry on or don't, um, they have to, I think, be very firm about making sure, that it, making sure that they somehow manage the process and take control rather than endless delays through the courts. The relationship between Quebec and Newfoundland? Yes. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> the relationship between... <laughs> I just want one. to throw that in there. <laughs> but you sound see, like you're relieved. <laughs> oh, that makes so, me and Alison yeah, Redford yeah. look like we were pals. I know. Uh, some would say the, 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 the relationship, it's not so much a relationship between governments, but relationship between peoples, in a sense, in Alberta and Quebec, maybe the misunderstanding. Or is Quebec simply, or, or is the conflicts you say in Quebec between Quebec and other provinces, basically Quebec and the other provinces? Or are there, no, the, how would you put that? Let, let me talk about the, the core interest in the, the talk. The core economic interest of Quebec with the rest of the country is with Ontario. Mm -hmm. You look at the numbers, that's where the trade happens. Interprovincial trade, we haven't talked about, is a very interesting issue for the country. And 20% of the GDP on average of provinces is about interprovincial trade. It's not insignificant and there's opportunities. I think there's a window of opportunity mm -hmm. for us on this interest, on this issue because of cumulative trade agreements that we've done, CETA, CPTPP, CPTPP plus USMCA, the new NAFTA, have, have brought us to a new moment, I think, where we could do more on interprovincial trade. Now, uh, on Newfoundland's a good, let, I'll share an anecdote I, you may remember. The last federal provincial meeting of the Council of Federation I did was in Halifax with yourself and I Allison, remember. you remember? Mm -hmm. And this conflict was brewing. It was at the beginning. Yeah. And I remember saying, I hope that, you don't this, mind sharing a secret, I remember saying to Allison and Christy at the time, that, you know, don't allow this story to turn into what it has been between Newfoundland and Labrador, between Alberta and British Columbia. The Newfoundland-Labrador-Quebec relationship has been a scar on the country. And it's one of the reasons why the Meech Lake Accords did not happen. Mm -hmm. And the people in Newfoundland-Labrador, rightfully so, feel that the agreement they entered into in the 1960s is unfair to them. And the simple truth of the matter is, it is. Now, the other side of the coin, by the way, is that when the government of Quebec negotiated that agreement, they did it in total good faith. There is no one around that table that was trying to take the other side for a ride. That's simply untrue. That is so true that when Daniel Johnson's father got elected in 1966, he asked his officials to look at undoing the deal with Newfoundland Labrador because he felt it was too favorable to Newfoundland Labrador. This is 1966. The years went by, and obviously we know today that the deal is very much skewed in favor of Quebec. And I think those who are, uh, you know, enlightened people here understand that, and they would like to fix it. And they'd like to find a way to fix it, because it's, it's just not fair. But we haven't been able to find that moment. Lucien Bouchard tried with Brian Tobin. It failed. I tried with Danny Williams. It didn't work and uh, with Danny, and then after that, at the Prairie Provincial meeting you had convened in 2011, Christy, mm -hmm. Dalton McGinty, Kathy Dunderdale, and I had a meeting, mm -hmm. and I'm not, I don't, I, I, this isn't public, but we discussed on how we could work out a deal, an agreement, to get something done that could help fix the deal by doing the new, uh, the new Lower Churchill project, and then, on Davos, I saw Stephen Harper, and I, I briefed the Prime Minister on this very confidentially, saying to him at the time, you know, we need to keep this very much under wraps because if it gets out there in the public, it'll spin out of control. And, and so, and then there was a, a change in government, but there was a willingness to do that. There's been one very significant change that I haven't seen. When I was in Premier of Quebec, 
We opened the door just a bit when Alison Redford said, let's do a national a strategy on uh, energy. Mm -hmm. She came to Quebec City. I'll never forget the meeting. She held a press conference and spoke French so well. You remember it was the period where the coach of the Montreal Canadiens spoke English only. I forget his name. And the first question she got was, can you coach the Montreal Canadiens? Because <laughs> she spoke French so well. And we opened the door just a little because it was until then religiously understood that the Quebec government would accept no involvement of the federal government in the area of energy, whether transport or production or, and there were reasons to do that because of concern of uh, countervailing duties in the states. François Legault, the new premier, has been out there saying, I want to do a national grid. And I'm ready to work with and, and, the federal, and get the federal government involved. And that is totally new. And I, I see that as, as progress. Now, the problem is the reverse side of the coin. His reaction to pipelines coming through Quebec wasn't exactly constructive and has left us in this very uncomfortable position. I'm worried about what I see in Alberta. I'm worried because they, the people of Alberta are feeling very frustrated, very, very frustrated and they're in a very bad mood, and they, uh, they're, they're lashing out uh, in regards to British Columbia and Quebec and the federal government. And that's not a good environment in which to do public policy. We've all, I've been there, but in that kind of environment, you are very vulnerable because it may lead to bad public policy mm -hmm. as opposed to good, uh, good decisions. So I'm hoping that, that uh, leads, lead, there'll be some leadership and that we'll get through this. We're going to open up the floor for questions, but before we do that, I'm going to ask a question that is maybe uh, not very politically correct in the sense that I'd like you both to talk a little bit about the partisan landscape uh, across the provinces and what that means. So we've had a number of important uh, elections in the past little yeah. while in, in Quebec, in Ontario. Brunswick, there's an ongoing Alberta election now, there's a minority government in British Columbia. What do you see in terms of that partisan landscape as affecting the future of federalism? I worry about that a lot mm -hmm. um, because I see federal and provincial parties on the, uh, in the center moving to the left and federal and provincial parties who were on the center right moving to the right. And um, what we see, the you know, social media has changed the dialogue completely. People are almost unwilling to engage on policy issues anymore, or often, too often, and it's an increasing problem. And I think we are losing in Canada um, a little bit, not as much as they have in the United States, our ability and our hunger for civil discourse. So you know, just as. Uh, Premier Charest used to have a good drag out fight with Jean Chrétien and then be able to talk to each other the next day. I don't think that happens as much in neighborhoods and in classrooms and in families anymore as it once did. And um, so are politicians responding to that by becoming more partisan or are po politicians causing that? I don't have the answer to that. but I think we should worry a lot about it. And I think this next federal election is going to be a very partisan, very personal, very um, ideologically pitched battle between right and left. Um, because, um, partly because we don't really have any parties federally that occupy the center of the spectrum the way that they once did. And I always, I really do believe that Canada is a better place when we are governed whether it's from the right or the left, but still from the center, ultimately. But when you're pulling apart rather than pushing together, it only gets worse, and I think that that's the, the place we're in now. We are affected here, as the rest of the world is, by this uh, a very strong, powerful undercurrent of populism and nationalism. And uh, it's about Brexit. It's about uh, the new president of uh, Brazil, uh, Obrador in Mexico. Uh, it's Europe. It's, uh, it's everywhere. And we are now experiencing a very important change in the world in the makeup of our politics leading towards 
more authoritarian regimes, more populist regimes, more nationalist regimes. I don't want to depress you too much, but if you add military spending to that, because there is a big, big military spend in the world now, you have a lot of ingredients there that are source of, source of concern when you bring them together. Uh, one of the characteristics of this new tone throughout the world is migration and immigration and refugees, and it is everywhere. And I think the difference in it, jurisdictions or countries is the level of intensity. Now, Trump is, of course, you know, the example of that, and you'll have Brexit and the uh, Canada, because of the makeup of our politics and our traditions, the level of intensity is lower. But we've just been through a provincial campaign here in Quebec where the theme was immigration and the reduction of the number of immigrants coming in on the basis of no empirical evidence, by the way, none, zero empirical evidence that there were reasons to reduce. Now, mind you, you'll, you could say there's no empirical strong evidence at the levels they were, but there was no empirical evidence at all. And yet it resonated very much with the electorate. So these are part, and I think you're gonna see that in the federal election campaign. By the way, I'd like to say Trump will be defeated, it'll go away, and the world will return to where it was, because a lot of us thought that way. I, I've come to the conclusion that that's not the case. That's right. We've now entered into a new period that is going to go on for the next few, and I think 10, 20, 30 years, where we're going to have to learn to deal with that. And center-right parties have a choice, a very cruel choice. If you want an example of that choice, watch Germany as in the change of leadership, to either confront the extremists and the populists or co-opt them. And most leaders are in a co-opting mood under the belief that if they co-opt them, they'll be able to stay in power and absorb their movement and eventually do give them a bit and do the right thing. Brexit is very much that story. It's about combating UKIP that threatened the ability of the Conservatives to get in government or stay in government. So Germany right now is a good example, Antonio. There's a change in the leadership with Chancellor Merkel and the new, her successor of the CDU is now in a co-opting mood. It's interesting to observe. And I think you'll see that here. So I'm, I think that's the world we're in right now. On the issue of partisanship, uh, most of the people you'll meet who le leave politics will tell you that part of what they left behind that they're relieved of is the, uh, is the, uh, sh the shackles of partisanship. And they look back on their careers. I'm among them. And I find, you f I find if I had any faults at all, that I was often too partisan. And, uh, but you're in that mode, mind you, we're asked to box. You know, politics is not social dancing. It's about a fight and a battle in the noble sense of the term. And when you're in the middle of that battle, you do. The other thing that's different, at least in my case, is that I was in politics at a time of the battle of uh, the referendum and Canadian unity. So I, I look back, I was a wartime general. And, uh, you know, the issue wasn't uh, a tax credit for the middle class, it was the future of the country. And the battles were, ever, it was winner keep all. Mm. And uh, I don't, uh, I look back at the scars and the period, it's a very tough period. And uh, you pay a very high price for that. So I don't miss the partisanship at all, but I think you'd probably, I don't know what your experience was, Christy, but I look back at my life and my career, if I had something I'd change, I'd say I'd be less partisan. I'd be more open and, and more relaxed in my, my views and more open to uh, engaging with my uh, adversaries and discussions with them and establishing relationships. I would say, Jean, Canada was incredibly lucky to have you as engaged in that well, debate when we did. Thank God for that. Merci, That's Mr. what I would say. Uh, merci. We have a few, um, we have time for a few questions. I was gonna say, I often do, um, oh, I wanted to impose sorry. House of Commons rules, but uh, House of Commons hasn't behaving, been behaving very well this week, so. But normally, if they were behaving uh, well, we would seek questions that are brief, I saw the, uh, ask for information on the topic at hand, the not thing. be a statement, argument, opinion, create disorder, or be of a personal nature. That's the way the House of Commons is supposed to work. Uh, we have a couple of mics set up. We also have a roving mic. 
Alors, je vous, euh, je vous encourage à être très bref dans vos questions. Euh, ça peut être à un ou l'autre de euh, de, des premiers ministres qui sont euh, avec nous. Euh, si vous voulez aussi vous, vous identifier, ça sera, ça sera très gentil. If you would like to just tell us who you are, that would be nice as well. Uh, Melanie Thomas from the University of Calgary. Very briefly, uh, we are in an election in Alberta, and one of the platform planks that's come up is a referendum on equalization if one party wins. I'm curious what either you think about that or what you would do if that was presented as one of your co-provinces doing something along those lines. You mean if we were still premiers yes. uh, in our respective provinces? Um, well, I, you know, it, it's a it's a ploy for sure. J, j, the Albertans want to get leverage in a re, in a, to renegotiate um, uh, <coughs> the deal. When I was sitting at the premier's table, there was a there was a strong appetite to renegotiate to figure out how we were going to make it work. And I'm not opposed to equalization, and I don't think most Albertans are either. To be honest with you, I think it's it's part of what makes Canada great is that provinces that have the ability to earn more money and fund more services should transfer some of that to provinces that don't have the capacity. That's, that's Canada, welcome, you know, welcome folks. Um, but the, the issues that, remember, this is not, equalization doesn't work as well as it should. There's lots of things that should be fixed and it's become this weird Kafka-esque process that most people don't understand. And the, the lag and how payments work, you can be a have-not <coughs> province and still making payments, and you can be a have province and getting payments, as we saw with Quebec recently. So I actually think that this referendum is about Alberta saying, we are fed up with Central Canada saying they want our money, but they don't want our oil. And I think it's just, that's, that's what Albertans are thinking. That's what Jason Kenney is speaking to and what Rachel Notley is speaking to. I don't think it's very healthy for the country. I don't think it's a good way to resolve it. But um, resolving issues in a healthy way during an election campaign is a really hard thing to do. But I do agree with Jean. I think this is a, we are, this really does pose a big problem for Confederation. Not just the, not just the fact of the referendum. More importantly, the subtext of it and the profound hurt feelings in Alberta, the biggest funder of you know, everything that we love in Canada by a long shot, I think they're about $5,000 per man, woman and child. The second biggest funder of Confederation is British Columbia and Ontario at $1,100, which is a long way back. And the only other province that contributes is Saskatchewan, which is about $383 per man, woman and child. So there's a real disparity in the way um, Canada works. I actually don't think equalization, although it needs to be addressed, is the central part of the problem. What would I do? Um, I think I think um, I, would, I would certainly be open to the idea, as I was when I was Premier, of having a good look at equalization in the country, because I think it needs to be done. But I don't think that's what's going to solve the problem. La péréquation? I, well, that, yes, and I'm very sympathetic to, to the people of Alberta. They're suffering right now. And uh, they're, they have a sense that they're not being listened to and that they're not being acknowledged, uh, that their, uh, their needs are being ignored, and, uh, and that's what they feel. If there's a lesson to draw from the election in the United States with Trump, I think, is that I think instinctively he latched on to a community of Americans who felt they were suffering. I, there was a very interesting moment in the campaign I saw for Trump where he, there had been a debate in the day after people were queuing up for a rally of his and the media were asking questions about something controversial he said. And the people in the queue understood that the media that was CNN interviewing them really didn't disagree with them or were sort of, and they became very hostile. And all of a sudden, it made me realize that one of the things that was happening in the American campaign, and I see a parallel with Alberta, is that the, these, Ameri these people who were voting for Trump were saying, I'm suffering, I'm hurting, and I'm very unhappy. And the answer they were getting from uh, the Democrats was, you're wrong. You know, how, how do you think you feel in a human perspective when you say this, I'm suffering and I'm hurting, we go, you're wrong. 
You're not suffering. You're not hurting. Well, I'm not. No, I, you're not. And in Alberta, that's what I see. There's the people are very much suffering. Their perception is that Quebec is uh, hostile to them. It isn't that they're hot. They start by saying I'm hostile to Quebec. Their view is Quebec is hostile to them. And so that's part of the makeup of the campaign, and I, I worry, uh, I worry about that because it, that's very unhealthy in the relationship. Now, on equalization, I'll give you the technical answer. It's a federal jurisdiction. It comes out of the federal coffers. It's in, written into the constitution. It's less money today relative to GDP than it was uh, on average since it was created in 1950s. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, there are equalization schemes in most modern countries in the world. Canada does not stand alone with an equalization scheme. It exists in Italy. It will exist in different forms in France, in Australia, New Zealand, and even in the United States. So this isn't unique to Canada. And the goal behind it is a very important goal, is one, to allow resources at a minimum level to exist to be able to do a certain number of things. All of that is all very commendable and should continue. Mm -hmm. But what they're trying to do, I think, and what Jason Kenney's trying to do is really make a statement through that, and, uh, and he'll make that statement. And hopefully his counterparts will be wise enough to understand what, why he's making it, and they'll acknowledge that, and they'll respond, help respond to the needs of Albertans. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. So, yeah. a question in the back. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Karen Abraham. Uh, merci de partager vos expériences avec nous. Uh, I have a question about uh, the pendulum between uh, decentralization and cent centralization. I'm, I'm noticing a lot of cities are getting together to solve common issues, and I'm curious uh, how, as premiers, how have you reacted to kind of uh, fixing the concentration of resources in cities and serving our rural communities. Uh, what policies have been most effective in bringing greater good to, uh, to people who might feel isolated in, in smaller communities? Thank Christine, you. Go ahead. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's an issue that exists in every province, no question about it. Um, and the thing is, is that cities are big spenders as big spenders. And I don't mean just in total money. I mean, they spent, they have some of the most expensive services provided anywhere in Canada. Um, their, their union agreements are richer, their executives are paid more, you name it. And meanwhile, rural communities really don't have the resources to be able to, to even serve their citizens adequately. Um, so uh, I, 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 have, I'm, I have sort of two thoughts on it. I think that cities, you know, one of the things we saw on this infrastructure, like latest infrastructure announcement, is that the feds are going to cut the provinces out and allow the cities to start, um, you know, kind of deciding among cities. Um, one problem with that is it's going to be very political because what you're going to see is governments that decide to put money in cities where, and in the parts of cities where they're likely to see some electoral gain. Not that that would be entirely mitigated by provinces, but I think it would be somewhat mitigated because we have different political interests. Uh, the other thing is, is that the federal government's job is really to join, like provinces, to join the country together even more than it is for the provinces. Who's thinking about the ports and the, I mean, Vancouver Port is the busiest port in the country. We move goods from Quebec and Ontario and lobsters from PEI. You guys, everybody in the country needs that connection to be strong and seamless. That's the federal government's job. If they want to have an economic impact and generate wealth and taxes and jobs, I think that's what they should be investing in, not, um, not focusing it on city projects. But you know, I was a politician too, <laughs> and we all like announcements. And with a federal election coming up, I think that that's, uh, that's part of it. So I think rural broadband, is really important because you can stimulate economic activity outside of cities. Um, that infrastructure is often hugely important in rural communities where resources and the attractive <coughs> industries are working because you can enable a mine to get open in a part of northern Ontario or northern Quebec if the infrastructure money is there. But it ain't sexy, it isn't water parks, and it's not community centers. And that's, to me, the struggle that happens in these discussions all the time. 
There, there's a very strong uh, trend in the world towards urbanization. And it's, <clears throat> it's very, it may be a little more obvious in emerging countries like China and India, and it's going to be a major shift in the course of our lifetime. It's happening at lightning speed, by the way, and has very positive consequences in a lot of cases because it allows to better educate and it allows, there's a whole sort of series of positive outcomes that governments all over the world see. Canada is, to the surprise of those who are not familiar with the country, one of the most urbanized countries in the world. And we are more urbanized than the United States, and if you want to understand part of the different political attitudes between Canada and the United States, the Americans are a much more rural society than we are. And that has an impact on political attitudes. Now, in our, I'm gonna be more severe than Christie because in our constitutional framework, the cities are very much within the jurisdiction of the provinces. They what, the, what we call the creature of the provinces. And Quebec has a very different attitude from the rest of the country about cities and municipalities. We have our Department of Intergovernmental Affairs, which is in reality a sect and a chapel. <laughs> Jean-Marc Fournier used to run, and it goes this way. We've had a law in Quebec that says, and my colleagues were surprised with this, no municipality can accept money from the federal government without prior authorization of the government of Quebec. Neither could non-governmental organizations or certain, uh, anyone who, and, and I think that is right, by the way, because what is at stake is the cohesiveness of your policies for infrastructure, and if you want them to be logical and cohesive, you need to bring that logic to it. I had many episodes where the federal government, and they still go around calling up the mayors and saying to the mayors, the prime minister, we'll have a meeting in Ottawa, please come over, and, and then we'll agree on an infrastructure program without the province's meeting. Every single time, I would say to the mayor of Montreal, please go to the meeting. Sit there in your chair and take notes, and please give your position. And I'm telling you in advance, absolutely nothing will happen unless we agree. Do not make the mistake of thinking you are going to carve out a single deal with the federal government because it ain't going to happen. And I don't agree. The last anecdote I'll tell you is about Paul Martin. Paul Martin, who I liked a lot, for a while went around saying, Canadians don't care whether yeah. it's the municipalities or the provincial governments or the feds. And, and he'd say that, and you know, people would nod their heads. They'd say, you know, you're right, we don't care. Who. Until I called Paul at one point. I said, Paul, I think I know what you're saying. I get it, and I think people agree with you. I just want to remind you, you're the Prime Minister of Canada. You're not a, an ordinary citizen. If you're out there saying, I'm gonna override the Constitution and do whatever I want, and you're the Prime Minister of Canada, there are consequences. And part of that is going to be a head-on collision with us. And so he changed his, uh, his approach. I think he understood that that wasn't in his interest to do that. So I'm very much of the school that the municipalities need to be uh, organized around the priorities of the provincial government to make it a cohesive uh, public policy. So we've talked about municipalities, provinces, we've talked about leadership, we've seen a master class in leadership from the two uh, former premiers who are with us uh, this afternoon. In many ways, um, this has been an extraordinary experience for all of us here. Uh, the McGill Institute of the Study of Canada was founded 25 years ago, almost 25 years ago, in part to enable these kinds of Canadian conversations. And I think that this afternoon we've been privy, uh, we've been witness, and we've also been very grateful to have you here to do that with us. Madame uh, Clark, you mentioned that Monsieur uh, Charest has been uh, served this country greatly. You have served this country greatly. You both have. And I think we just want, I want to extend on behalf of, the, of McGill University, of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, our very deep uh, thanks. Merci beaucoup d'avoir été si généreux uh, avec vos pensées, mais aussi uh, uh, votre façon de nous faire partager un peu des moments d'histoire uh, de notre de notre fédéralisme. Merci Thank beaucoup. You. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Can I share an anecdote with you? I have a. I want to. One one last anecdote. Before Danielle, I want to share an anecdote with you because 
When I left in 2012, I, I joined McCarthy Tetro and I do a tour of the country. I go to Vancouver and I call Christy and ask her whether she's available to see me. She says, great, and she, you're, this was just before your campaign, and, and I'm a big fan of, of Christie's, of what you, uh, everything you've accomplished. So we uh, set up a, a meeting, and, uh, and then we have dinner in the evening. And uh, so we went out to a restaurant, had the we had a great dinner, a lot of fun, and I came in uh, uh, to the, the hotel, I called my wife, Michelle. And uh, so she said, what did you do today? I said, well, you know, I went, I saw Christy Clark, I went meeting, we had dinner. And then she says to me, you know, this is Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ever, Busted. I am ever I, hopeful, Jean. I said, it, oh yeah, it is, huh? So she said, uh, what did you, where did you go? I said, well, well we, we, we went to a restaurant. And there's a long silence. She said, in public? <laughs> yeah. Well, the other options I didn't think were uh, very good. So well, you are forever going to be remembered as my Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs>